Good morning, Grace. It's time to start our worship by standing and singing together our welcome song. Let's put our masks on and sing together, Descend, O Spirit. Descend, O Spirit, purging flame. Brand us this day with Jesus' name. Confirm our faith, consume our doubt. Sign our says Christ within, without. Sign our says Christ within, without. Descend, O Spirit, as a dove. Clothe us this day. Love. Mark us as children of the King, then send us forth in Jesus' name, then send us forth in Jesus' name. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. My name is Nick Swan, and I'm the assistant pastor here at Grace. I also want to welcome all those who are with us uh, virtually this morning. So glad that you could join us. Uh, our mission at Grace is to welcome our neighbors to grow together in Christ and serve God in our community and our world. And if you'd like more information about how you can connect to what we're doing at Grace, you can check us out on our website, gracenorthshore.org. Also, if you're visiting, you can fill out either a physical Connect card or a virtual Connect card on our website under the Connect tab. We'd love to get to know you, know that you're here, and follow up uh, with you. We're going to begin our service this morning with our call to worship from Psalm 30, verse 4. Let me read our call to worship. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Let me pray for us. Our glorious God, Father, Son, and spirit. Thank you that we can gather this morning in this glorious weather that you have provided for us and gather that we might worship and glorify you. Father, I pray that you would allow us to rest in you this morning, to be nourished by you this morning through your spirit, and that our hearts might be filled with joy to overflowing because of the salvation we have in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue now in song. I heard the voice of Jesus say. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, O weary one. Lay down your head upon my breast. I came to Jesus. Jesus, as I was weary and worn and sad, I found in Him a resting place, and He has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I look to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I walk till traveling days are Light of life, I'll walk till traveling days are done. 
You may be seated. We come now to confess our sins to God. And I want us to do it in light of the verse we just sang. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water, thirsty ones, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in him. We come to Christ every week because we're thirsty and we need our souls satisfied. And we also come knowing that he delights to satisfy us with Christ. And so as we come, we can come now freely to drink of the mercy and the forgiveness and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Let me read now our confession of sin. Please join me in your hearts and minds. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have sinned and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done. O Lord, have mercy upon us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises given to all people in Jesus Christ. And grant, merciful Father, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and humble life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Please take a moment to silently confess your sins. Hear now the promise of the forgiveness that is freely given to us in Christ Jesus. This is from Psalm 103. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Amen? Amen. Chris Reed's now going to come up for our children's sermon. Thank you, Nick. Good morning, Grace Prez. Also, good morning to my littles. It's super exciting to see you guys uh, here this morning. I have a couple of movies uh, in my hand, um, and I'll explain why in a moment. But before I do, I want you guys to think about your favorite movie. If you had to pick one, I know I have two, but if you had to pick one. And also, how many times have you seen that movie? And guys, I bring it up because I have two of my favorites from when I was your age, Home Alone and Finding Nemo. These are two that I know like the back of my hand. P. Sherman, 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney. Um, I know the movies. Um, and friends, I bring it up because I, though I've seen these movies so many times, I, I watched these a couple months ago and it, I was fascinated by how I realized things I did not know when I watched them as a child. Things I did not see and did not understand. And I bring it up because at VBS this coming week, we will look at a story that many of us have known since we were little. It's the story of Jonah and the big fish. This is a story we know uh, like the back of our hand, but I'm here to submit that I believe this week We'll see things we've never seen in the story before, things uh, we'll find out about God. And so this week, church, if you could be praying uh, for VBS this coming week, uh, that God would uh, strengthen uh, the faith of our little ones. And I'm going to pray for that really quickly, uh, but we hope to see you there. Next week, VBS, it's going to be a great time. Uh, let me pray for us really quickly. Dear God, I thank you for our children. I thank you that um, you love them and that you care for them. God, I ask that you would uh, just move in a mighty way this coming week at VBS, um, that we would not be too familiar uh, with the story of Jonah and the big fish, um, but that you would um, show us new things in the story about your grace, your love, your compassion um, for all people. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, Grace. My name is Chris Colquitt. I'm the uh, RUF campus minister at Northwestern. It's great to be with you all this morning. I invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy. 
We are, this is kind of a bridge sermon between two series. We just wrapped up a series on the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, and next week Marshall will be starting a series on the book of James. And the final sermon in the fruit of the Spirit was on self-control. And the first sermon in James will be on standing steadfast in the midst of suffering. And this text today addresses both of those issues and looks to the issue of strength in the Christian life, something I think we may not talk enough about. And so as we open the word, I'd invite you to open to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to read verses 6 to 14 and then the first verse of chapter 2. For this reason... I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And then down to verse one of chapter two. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This is God's word. It is absolutely true and it's given to us in love. Let's pray for our time this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us that you've revealed to yourself to us in your word. Lord, we could not know you if you did not tell us about yourself. And so now we pray that you would help us to attend to your word, Lord. By your Holy Spirit, would you open our minds and hearts and eyes and ears to see and treasure Christ and to put our trust in him in all things. We ask this in his name. Amen. Our theme today is strength. And though our English translations hide this from us, strength actually appears four times in the passage that we just read. The same Greek root word that's translated strength in chapter 2, verse 1, also has the idea of power or the idea of being able to do something. And so in verse 7, we have a spirit of power or strength. In verse 8, we're called to share in suffering by the power of God, by the strength of God. In verse 12, it says that God is able to guard until that day that which has been entrusted God is strong, God is powerful to guard these things. And then chapter two, verse one, we are called to be strengthened or empowered or enabled by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So this is a theme of our text this morning. We wanna ask three questions, look at three points. First, the need for strength. Second, excuse me, first, the nature of strength. Second, the need for strength. And third, the source of that strength. So what is it? Why do we need it and how do we get it? The nature, the need, and the source. First, the nature. We can learn a lot here about strength by looking at its opposite, looking at the contrast that Paul draws. Look at verse 7 again. Paul says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. This idea of fear, sometimes it's translated timidity or cowardice. And we've already seen that this idea of strength is connected to power and ability. And so the question we want to ask ourselves as we're reading our Bible is, why is Paul here contrasting strength with fear? Why not strength with weakness or strength with inability? Strength with being ineffectual, he says fear. And, and it points to this reality in this text that for Paul, strength has this profoundly internal component. When we talk about someone being a strong person... We can mean that in two ways. I'm a strong person if I can lift a lot of weight. I'm a strong swimmer if I can swim for a long time. I'm strong at X, Y, or Z because of my ability to do it. But then there's another sense in which we can talk about someone being a strong person by their internal strength, by their courage, by their fortitude, resiliency, grit. And the contrast here with fear suggests that Paul 
is at least particularly interested in that second aspect of strength. This is not about lifting a lot of weights. This is about something internal to Timothy and his approach to the world. What's very interesting is in the rest of the Bible, there are many calls for the people of God to be strong and courageous. In almost all of them, the contrast is with fear. Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid. And that's what Paul is doing here as well. Of course, there's a connection between our inner strength in this sense and the actual outworking of our lives. We see this in sports most powerfully. Um, the sports people figure this out. You don't need the Bible to figure this out. Confidence and courage and internal strength is important for success when you go out on the field. So sports psychologists tell athletes to envision success, to, to step up to the plate confident. And if anyone here has ever played golf, um, you may be good or bad, but if you step up and try to hit a golf shot with hesitancy and not sure of yourself, it's going to go poorly. Uh, if you're a bad golfer like me and you step up with some confidence, it might go okay. And so this inner strength is connected. It's connected to our actual lives and outworking of it. So that's what, that's, that's what Paul's getting at here, we think. So then the second question we ask is, why do, why do we need it? Why does Timothy need it? What is the need for strength? The immediate context here, Timothy is a young pastor. Timothy's a young pastor. He's Paul's protege. And Paul is concerned that Timothy is fearful. He's timid. He looks at his ministry and it's going to be difficult and he's shrinking back from the task and he's trying to encourage him. He's writing to Timothy, trying to encourage him as he goes about his business. The way he encourages him, though, is, is interesting and unique and maybe not the way we would normally do it because uh, I'm, I'm the father of young kids and our, our kids sometimes get scared. And I don't do what Paul does. So Margaret is our oldest when she, she's six now. When she was a little smaller, we were living in California and we got to go to the beach every Tuesday night. We had Taco Tuesday, we went to the beach. It was great. We'd set up our stuff, our chairs, we'd play in the sand, we'd run down in the ocean. They have real waves in California. Uh, they, we, Margaret had a great time. She loved it. Joy, joy, joy. Until one day, inexplicably, she was terrified of the waves. We're sitting 20 yards back from the waves and Margaret freaking out because the waves are going to come get us. Daddy, we have to move back. We have to move back. And so we moved back five, five yards. No, 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 Daddy, we have to move back. Until we were off the beach, on the grass, looking down at the ocean. And what did I tell Margaret in that moment? I said, Margaret, you don't need to be afraid. The, the waves are not going to get you. You're safe. You're protected here. See where they stop? They stop there. We, you're you're going to be Okay. And that's our temptation anytime people are scared in our lives. We're saying, no, 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 you're going to be okay. Don't be scared. There's no reason to be scared. And yet that's not what Paul does. Because if you read the rest of 2 Timothy, he doesn't sugarcoat the challenges that are going to face Timothy. He doesn't downplay the dangers. He'll tell Timothy that the world is going from bad to worse. Anybody relate to that this morning? He's going to tell Timothy that suffering in his life is inevitable, inescapable. He'll tell him that even his followers, even the people that like him, are eventually going to stop like him, stop liking him, and chase after other things. And then, oh, by the way, Timothy, you can't trust yourself because you need to flee from your youthful passions. Because that same war that Marshall talked about last week that rages on inside of us, Timothy, that's raging on inside of you and you have to fight against sin. And all of this is going to be hard, and yet he still says to Timothy, and he still says to you and to me, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And before we think about how that strength works, I think we want to sit and, and find ourselves in Timothy's story. There's only a couple pastors here, but this, this fear that Timothy has is directly relevant, I think, to many of us. The most immediate application is that Timothy is experiencing fear, he's experiencing timidity, he's He's tempted to be ashamed of the gospel in the face of suffering and opposition to it. And when we talk about persecution and suffering as Christians, today, most of the time, those conversations go something like, this might be coming down the pike, culture's moving a certain way, we're going to have persecution in the future. Right? But what I want to suggest this morning is that the stuff that Timothy's dealing with, we are all dealing with every day, even now, in our lives. 
We, especially in the worlds that many of us walk in, have become professional shapeshifters. We walk and live in spaces where to be a Christian and associated with the gospel is to be at risk of being thought much less of. We're not like those Christians. We're respectable Christians. And so we find a way to navigate these worlds in which we exist. I see this in my students. I did this in college. I did this as a lawyer. We find our ways to navigate this in a way that we won't be seen as that kind of Christian, as that weirdo, right? We want to be respectable. And, and the reality is the main tactic for that is to be quiet. And that quietness, that fear that we have, Paul is speaking to in Timothy. He feels the same way. And so the question for us this morning that we need to wrestle with are you this morning willing to be misunderstood and thought less of for the sake of Jesus and the gospel? Is that something you're willing to undergo? Or are we like Timothy? Are we scared? And if we are, we need to be encouraged and we need to be strengthened. But the strength here that Paul is talking about is not simply about not being ashamed of the gospel. There's more here as well. And I think we can broaden this application to see that this passage is also about the strength to live a life of faith and faithfulness in the midst of the callings to which we've been called and in the face of opposition. Life is hard and following Jesus in this world is difficult and this is true for all of us. If we look at those two ideas connected to strength or power in, in verse seven of chapter one, what does it say? A spirit of power and love and self-control. And those two ideas of self-control and love point to this. Self-control is hard. Marshall talked about this last week. It's a fight. There's a war raging within us. And we can look at our sin and our flesh and we can get scared and we can shrink from that battle and we can kind of wilt up and say, well, this just kind of is what it is. Or we can have courage and we can stand strong and fight. And then we're also called to love. We're called to walk out into the world seeking the interests of others and laying down our own for their sake in the pattern of Jesus, which is a call to death, a call to suffering. We're called to go out and seek the good and the true and the beautiful in a world that is ugly and broken and evil. And this work is difficult. This work is challenging. This work requires the strength that Timothy is talking about. And if we do not have it, if we shrink at the world at which we find, at ourselves as we look at ourselves, we will be ineffectual. We will be like that golfer who steps up shaking to the shot and, and, and makes no contact. So how do we get strength? Well, here we come to our third point, the source of strength, and it's the most surprising and beautiful aspect of this passage. Chapter 2, verse 1 tells us to be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's one of those verses that if you were reading 2 Timothy, you would say, oh, that sounds nice. I like that. I want to be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And most of us would just go ahead and keep reading because that's a nice sentiment, right? But, but I want to drill down for a second. How in the world, Paul, does grace strengthen us? That actually doesn't make a lot of sense on first glance because what's grace about? Isn't the gospel about our own weakness? Isn't the gospel about us not being strong and God being strong? Doesn't Paul elsewhere boast in his weakness? He's excited about his weakness. And so, so Paul, how does grace, this story, this gospel that tells me I am weak and Jesus saves me, how does that make me strong? It's supposed to humble me, right? And I think to this, Paul nods along with every one of our questions and says, yes, yes, that's exactly it. That's exactly right. At the, heart, at the middle of our passage in verses 9 and 10, we have one of the clearest and most beautiful statements of the gospel in all the Bible, I think. Um, a lot of people don't read 2 Timothy because it's way back there, but this is a good one to, to, to write down and memorize. Look at verses 9 and 10. He, God, God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 
And so in the middle of Paul's encouragement to Timothy, his call to strength, at the heart of that call, he puts this beautiful statement of the gospel. Why does he do that? Well, because the gospel actually gives us a radical strength that no other source can provide. And it does that by moving our eyes, by shifting our eyes away from ourselves and away from the dangers and putting them on Christ who cares for us. And in that movement, we have the source of strength. The gospel takes our eyes off of ourselves. Christians, if you are here this morning and you are in Jesus, you have been saved not because of your works, not because of your strength, not because of anything in you, but because of God's own purpose and grace. And that salvation that you have is contingent not on your continued strength, but on God's strength alone. The one who spoke this world into being, the one who calls the stars by name every night, he's the one who has your salvation in his hands. And so when the road is hard and there is danger at hand and you do not feel enough, know that you have never been enough. It takes our eyes off of ourselves and then it also takes our eyes off of the dangers. Christ, Paul says, has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light in the gospel. Paul says to you and to me and to Timothy this morning, brothers and sisters, life is hard. You're going to suffer. This is going to be hard and you're going to probably die at the end of the day. But that is not the end of the story, and your life is not here. It is hidden with Christ in heaven. And immortality has been brought to light. Death has been abolished. And so the danger of you dying and the danger of every little death that stands in between you and your death is abolished in Jesus. And so that loss of reputation that is threatened by someone knowing that you go to a church like Grace someone knowing that you actually believe in Jesus, right? That's, that's gone. It's a danger, but your eyes are taken off because you have glory with Jesus forever. And if heaven forbid someday you are ch- ch- forced to choose between life and death on the basis of your confession, you will choose life. You will, cho- you will choose death willingly knowing that beyond it lies life. And so Jesus in the gospel takes our eyes off ourselves, it takes our eyes off the desert and it, puts, it points them on Jesus who has secured all these blessings for us. So our, our second child, Henry, middle, middle child is a boy. He does not share uh, Margaret's timidity. Uh, he is a crazy man and he worries me as a result. And we were recently at another body of water in Texas and, uh, and Henry is not scared Henry wants to go and reach in and touch the water, even though he's three years old and cannot swim and would die if he fell in. And I corrected him, corrected him, and got tired of correcting him and said, okay, Henry, let's go do it. And, and I thought, you know, we'll see how this goes. And it actually worked out well. I grabbed him by the legs and hung him upside down over the water and said, okay, Henry, touch it. Go down and touch the water. Now, you can imagine what he did. He clung to me like never before. He's like, no, 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 daddy. Because he realized past his three-year-old disobedience, that he was going to drown if he fell in that water. He couldn't swim. There was danger. He was terrified. And that was a good lesson for not touching the water. But then I went further and I said, hey, look, I got you, buddy. Touch the water, right? Because he looked up and he saw that his daddy, who's the strongest man that he knows, who's only dropped him once and he doesn't remember that, right, (laughs) had a hold of him. Right? And so his eyes needed to go away from the water and away from himself and his own weakness. And he saw that he was held by daddy. And in that, he had confidence and courage and reached out and touched the water. And sadly, we did it about a thousand times after that because it was, it was this joy that he had. This is, what, this is what the gospel does to us. There are dangers out there and we are weak. But in Christ, our eyes are taken away from it and placed on him. We have an inner strength, Paul calls us to, but it's not internally sourced. Most people talk about inner strength, digging down, finding something inside of you. We have an inner strength by looking outside ourselves to Jesus. COVID is a hard season. I, I, I challenge anyone to tell me it's not. 
Um, and if you're like me, I'm getting tired of myself and I'm getting tired of the world outside me. I'm just kind of over it both, right? And Jesus comes to you and to me in that moment and he says, hey buddy, lift up your eyes, look at me. Look at me, the author and perfecter of your faith, the one who has come and secured all blessing for you and find courage and strength. Yes, this life will be hard. Yes, the fight of faith will be with its challenges. But I am with you. Be strengthened by my grace. Everything you need, I have, I have won. I have got a hold of you. Rest in me and be strong. This is the gospel, friends. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus as you go out today and live your lives. Let's pray. God in heaven, we are grateful beyond words that our salvation is not dependent on ourselves. God, we look at ourselves and we look at this world and we are discouraged. And yet you draw our eyes away from us. You draw our eyes away from the dangers and you put them on you and we see that we have great reason for confidence and great reason for courage and great reason for strength. And we do pray that you would work more and more in us this spirit of power, that you would free us from our fears and timidity and that you would give us great confidence as we go to seek to follow you, to walk in the pattern of Jesus. We ask this all in his name. Amen. We'll now continue in song. Please stand, put on a mask, and sing with me for all the saints. brief uh, announcements before we close with the doxology. Uh, first, just a reminder to sign up each and every week. That allows us to know you're here to help with any contact tracing. Uh, but also, as we begin to transition inside, we have plenty of overflow space out here, but we won't in there. So if we could all get in the habit of signing up, that would be great. Uh, also, thank you for your generosity. So many of you have given faithfully through this time. Uh, just a reminder, you're able to give online, or we have self-addressed stamped envelopes at the table at the back uh, if you would like to give by check. Uh, also, as Chris said, Chris Reed said, please be praying for VBS. We have 50 plus kids here this week. 
lots of organization, lots of administration. So pray for strength for all the teachers and organizers. Also pray for the young children. It's a wonderful opportunity for them to hear the gospel. And also pray for the parents. Oftentimes children will be brought, they might be exploring the church, and it's a wonderful opportunity for us to reach out to the parents. So please be praying for VBS and all of those details uh, this week. Let's sing now the doxology together. Sing with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. I receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.